So I'm going to talk about environmental uh, medicine. It all starts in your first environment, the first human environment, which is the building. So uh, preventing diseases is the first place. If you, you want to prevent diseases, the first place you have to work in is uh, the home. Why is it the first environment? Because uh, because of uh, the proximity, we're very close to emissions, we're very close to what's around us, and also because of the time we spend there in the home. It's an average, of course. Uh, people are surprised to read that they spend nine and a half hours in the bedroom. Those are averages, uh, integrating weekend and the time uh, children spend in their rooms uh, doing their homework or playing. So the building, indoor air, is the first environment. Indoor air is the first uh, exposure of the human body. Oftentimes, we think that we spend a lot of time uh, outdoors. It's not true. We spend very little time outdoors. But uh, indoor air, if you count uh, housing, offices, schools, uh, commercial, real estate, uh, transportation, all this represents uh, the three quarters of our exposure. So uh, indoor air is the maximum way of exposure. What's surprising, and this is going, we're going to see that with air, uh, exposure through liquids and solid food is very few. Whereas we talk a lot about that and we don't talk so much about indoor air. All this was already talked about by the previous speakers, but I'd like to insist, how is it that the building influences health? You already know that, uh, of course, uh, through air uh, and the atmosphere. It's a major direction, of course, natural light. Natural light also synchronizes our biological rhythms. Uh, that is something you need to take into account. We lack uh, light and we lack uh, darkness. Uh, what, how can you say that? Yeah, because with artificial light, uh, you reduce uh, the number of hours you get melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that regulates all the others. Uh, it is uh, secreted in the brain only in the dark uh, during the night. So when you sleep, you need darkness. Uh, then uh, temperature, of course, uh, here again, the standards we have are not automatically adapted. Oftentimes, they're meant for adults, not for children. They're designed for uh, a warm, uh, cold countries and not for tropical countries. I am now uh, working on very hot countries. You can't use the same bases. Uh, those standards are not automatically adapted. So. Every time you need to adapt uh, to the place. The level of uh, water and rain, you know that in on the beach it's between 40 and 60 percent, the increase in mold and insects. There's a big population living in uh, moisture, so you shouldn't increase moisture too much because of the pests acoustics and everything you get through the senses. It's not only a question of what you hear or see. It has an impact on the whole body through the vegetative nervous system. So noise, for example, of course you may say, I don't like noise, but it's much deeper than that. Uh, you can have a cardiovascular reaction. You have hypertension that can be created by noise. We know that uh, from people who live near airports. For example, people with uh, sleep disorders. Uh, in France, we've just uh, finished an assessment of uh, the financial cost of noise. In France, 57 billion euros a year. That is the cost of noise. This morning, we've talked about six pollutants, 19 uh, billion, whereas the noise is 57 billion. And we're not even uh, talking about the noise in the hospital. We're just talking about the noise in uh, housing, dwellings, and offices. 57 billion. Out of that amount, in France, you have seven uh, m million, sorry, seven million inhabitants exposed uh, to more than 50 decibels uh, during the night. Uh, that is going to lead to sleeping uh, disorder. 
and uh, that represents 11 billion euros. So it's not trivial. Oftentimes we say noise doesn't kill, it's only considered as a nuisance, but it's much deeper than that. We have to work on the sound environment of our buildings. Then. Uh, I've also indicated a number of parameters that are not talked about so much. Uh, a previous speaker talked about water. Uh, you realize that you no longer talk about water in the buildings. Uh, uh, people say, well, uh, the water is of good quality, but it's not that easy. Water going through pipes uh, can be contaminated by the pipes, so water also deserves some attention. After that, you have the electromagnetic environment, uh, the EMC. Let's not be too worried about that, but it needs to be taken into account, especially for children. They're the most sensitive to uh, electromagnetic uh, events, uh, uh, voltage lines. Uh, it's not talked about so much nowadays, but in some cases it can be a reality in radioactivity. I don't want to scare you, but it's just to talk to you about radon. That is natural gas coming from the ground, uh, and you have to mention it. Um, let's now focus on uh, two themes, air, given its importance, and light. For air, the figures are fantastic. We can't live more than three minutes without air. But uh, you can spend three days without drinking and 30 days without eating. So you see how important air is. Whereas a lot of people are worried about what they drink, what they eat, uh, they do research on that. Uh, you didn't uh, ask us today whether the uh, air was good, uh, but you are sure that the drinking, the water was drinkable. So the quantity that you inhale, the figures are averages. It all depends on your build and other factor, but on, on average, it's between 12,000 and 15,000 liters of air in the lungs per day. That's between six and eight liters of air per minute. Imagine how much air you've inhaled uh, while here. I'm sure the quality of the air is good here, but nevertheless, uh, it's important. Another important thing, the number of uh, um, lung uh, cells you have. When you're uh, born, uh, you have 58 uh, million alveolas. As soon as you're born, the children, the child uh, unfolds uh, the alveola, and that's why the children uh, uh, screams and then you have a multiplication in number of alveolas so that at two years old you have your final number of alveola. You won't have more than that. So you Im understand how important uh, the air quality is in kindergarten because this is when you have the multiplication of those uh, alveolas. And in total, 300 million of lung alveola or uh, have an important uh, role, you have already a loft in uh, your chest because you have 75 square meters. Some have more or some have less, but on average, you see the figure is already very high, 75 square meters uh, in uh, your lung. That explains that uh, the five liters in your blood uh, in one minute they're going to go through uh, over those 75 square meter, which means that every minute spent here, the total number, the total amount of your blood has been in contact with the air to take oxygen, uh, to take in oxygen, to evacuate uh, carbon dioxide and exhale other pollutants. This air quality. You see the figures that are uh, very important. What uh, uh, does this give in terms of health when uh, the quality of uh, inside air is degraded? You have uh, smells. The only measurement device we have to measure is our smell. It is our only device, a problem. It's not reliable to measure the quality of air. 
because it can be mistaken when you have a good smell, when you feel something good, you're very happy, perfumes. Uh, yes, that's all very nice, but those smells, even though they're pleasant, they can be irritating and create allergies. Whereas uh, sometimes you have a fatal smells and do not have a, a smell like carbon monoxide. So our smell helps us, but not always very much. Then you have uh, all of the drop in performance. You have to look at the psychosomatic side. There aren't only physical, you have irritation, inflammations, uh, allergies, asthma, headache, dizziness, fatigue, uh, CV diseases. Uh, for example, the fine uh, matter, the partic particulate matter inhaled are going to clog the arteries and uh, give uh, infarctions and uh, strokes. Uh, the uh, carbon monoxide intoxication and cancers, of course, uh, with asbestos, uh, particulate matter, radon, and benzene. So here you have a number of uh, cancer-causing uh, compounds uh, in um, inside air and also all of the endocrine problems. But uh, when you have a good quality inside, it's going to provide uh, more well-being at home, at school, and the office. Of course, we're going to have uh, the reverse uh, effect. You're going to have an improvement in performance. Uh, a lot of Danish studies, by the way, are done on this subject and provide very interesting results. When the quality of uh, indoor air is improved with more renewal, you have more better performance of uh, schools, employees, you reduce uh, uh, sick uh, building disease. Uh, in the U.S., uh, for example, 15% of the flu is... Uh, related to sick building because if uh, renewal of the air is not uh, sufficient, you're going to have more contamination. Therefore, the uh, environment can uh, spread uh, infectious diseases. Uh, you have the socioeconomic cost, uh, as we've already mentioned. So much for air because it's a very important thing. Second very important uh, thing, daylight, uh, the visual effects. Uh, you all know that light allows you to see, it facilitates activity, it increases security. And uh, in fact, uh, light is the mother of color, so much for the visual part. But in our approach of uh, light and building, that's all we talk about. There's a visual effect. Uh, I see I have a number of luxes. It's not, there's more than that. There are non-visual effects that are very important. For example, circadian rhythms, all of our biological rhythms. Light synchronizes uh, all this. Uh, hormones, melatonin, cortisol. If you get up in the morning, it's because you, you have a little uh, cortisol, and that is what wakes you. That is uh, very nice. Um, here, for example, you have a very nice aspect of light. Of course, there are economic uh, advantages. Uh, you have uh, maintenance architectural advantages. Now, what are the challenges we have to overcome if we want to improve the situation? We have two major obstacles. First, uh, we have to have a holistic approach from the planning of building till occupancy and uh, health should be the red uh, thread when I choose my land, when I build my radon, when I use my radon card in France, for example, in those areas, you have to pay attention to this uh, natural radioactive gas compound. Of course, uh, in the cities, necessarily, you have to integrate uh, traffic, road traffic. In your plan, you have uh, to integrate ergonomics and other things. Uh, so throughout the chain, you have to integrate quality of there. Regarding vegetations, of course, uh, plants uh, can create allergies to some species. But uh, for example, 
and you can have balconies like here, but when you're too close to apartments, you're going to fixate a particular matter. And uh, when uh, there's rain, uh, of course, there's going to be a lixiviation. So that is uh, interesting to limit exposure to particles. You have to take it account of uh, cold sun. The light, we try and integrate light in all the uh, rooms, even in the bathroom, especially in the bathrooms, you're going to choose the products. You have to be pay attention to low emission. You renew the air, all this we've said. And finally, our last step, which is important, as far as our regulations are concerned, we have to make sure that health is part and parcel in all of all regulations. We all talk about energy, carbon. This is a French label, which is going to become compulsory. I'm sorry, but there's no health in it. Uh, it should be uh, E and uh, C plus health. Uh, now we talk about circular economy here again. We have to ask ourselves the questions. Of course, we're not going to throw the baby with the bath, uh, uh, but uh, we have to ask ourselves the uh, questions. Uh, if uh, I use wood treated in 1960s with uh, uh, lendane and a, a pest control substance uh, that is uh, dangerous, but we do have a number of challenges, and I'd like to uh, thank you for your interest.